Hello, everyone. I am 70s gypsy fortune teller Michelle Minion. Uh, and uh, I am a minion that has been on this channel before. Uh, if you watch my previous video, you can check that out. It was relatively a year ago since uh, I've appeared again. And unlike me discussing Young Frankenstein, I'm going to be discussing, in particular, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Now, you might be wondering, why am I addressing, in particular, The Hunchback of Notre Dame? And how does it have any way, shape, or form to do with Halloween? Well, basically, uh, within the sort of era of when film was being developed and eventually pushed more so into the mainstream, so we're talking within the silent era of film from the 1920s, um, there was this sort of push to uh, sort of create monsters uh, because a lot of people were fascinated about the tales that were associated oftentimes with monsters and um, a lot of that uh, inspired Hollywood to sort of really push it forward as a main selling point to get people into the theater and get invested into this kind of filmmaking. And it also spawned uh, the real artistry, in particular dealing with makeup, uh, as you can probably tell um, if you watch a lot of these various monster films. Now, before I get into The Hunchback of Notre Dame in particular, uh, I would like to emphasize that there was another minion a year ago who did emphasize the various universal monsters. Now, this in particular, um, not only for their age are they considered classics, but they seemed to maintain a significant amount of attention and revenue for them. So they were sort of iconic for their day and they still kind of remain in that sort of spotlight as these very uh, groundbreaking sort of type films, especially when it came to launching this um, this uh, concept of bringing sort of these evil monsters, so to speak, to life. And even though Quasimodo is not evil, he was technically the first of the Universal Monster series. Now, in case you don't know, uh, and explain this more in detail, and uh, it's explained more in detail uh, from a previous video that was last year, uh, Universal pertains in particular to Universal Studios, um, which does have a very long and interesting history, uh, and if you definitely look up more information on that, uh, it is rather fascinating. And they still have a, uh, some of the monster sets that they originally used for these kinds of films, if you ever go to Universal Studios, in particular the one in Hollywood. So without further ado, though, let me address The Hunchback of Notre Dame in particular. Uh, this was the first one. It is technically a silent film, so there is no voice. So if you have trouble um, identifying with films that don't have people talking in them, uh, this might be a discouragement for some viewers. But I actually find silent films rather fascinating um, because they really give out the expression of the actors. It kind of lets the actors sort of take in the emotions um, and it, it's almost like there's just certain points where you feel like it, the, the looks on their faces, you know, it's just, there's just no really particular words to describe, you know, what they're feeling or what they're going through, you know, it's, it's all very visualized, uh, silent films. And I think that's what makes it rather entertaining and I think engaging to watch because you're really looking into the performance and not so much of the words that they're saying. Um, so basically this particular adaptation of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, which I believe was made in 1923, uh, was um, trying to be a lot like the uh, book, 
although it there are various detours that this uh, adaptation takes and you'll see those detours if you choose to watch this film and in particular the ending is rather different as well and in case for a background in case you have no idea what the hunchback of notre dame is about as a story well basically it's about a hunchback named quasimodo who lives in a bell tower and ultimately um is under the sort of supervision and guard of this um church figure named cloud frollo and eventually you'll see how he uh sort of gets into uh, sort of the outside world and uh, meets Esmeralda and so pretty much everything that you see from the Victor Hugo book sort of happens within this story as well and again there are various detours that it takes to and it puts certain scenes in that obviously did not whatsoever occur within the book so but primarily its st story is structured in the same way, um, you know, with the same characters um, and similar scenarios. And now Lon Chaney in particular uh, was a famous actor during the time. And this was one of, I guess, his more well-known works. And he does play Quasimodo. And there was a huge emphasis on the makeup. Um, and you can really tell by uh, not just his performance, but the sets and the uh, makeup, the all the other actors that are involved. This was a production that really did take itself seriously. Now, I think some people might be divided on this ending because this ending is not consistent with a lot of other adaptations of this particular story. Um, on the one hand, I can understand the fact that they needed to sort of make um, maybe a different angle onto the story, only because there have been various attempts to try and showcase the story throughout the years. Um, and I personally think it suits itself well. Is it the best representation of... Um, you know, like really the Victor Hugo story, maybe not necessarily, but at the same time, it still provides you a interesting point of view uh, when it comes to the whole uh, concept of the Hunchback of Notre Dame. So I think that's something that's important to note. You know, it's not designed to be uh, a complete replica of the book and i think that's kind of good that adaptations sort of take these kinds of risks and uh put in different ideas and not just copy and paste onto uh what they read out of the book so i i think that's that overall the the different ending although it's maybe not as satisfying or as um or doesn't really rile up your emotions as much as maybe some other adaptations do this one still offers a very unique uh, interpretation uh, and the interesting thing too is this is oftentimes although there are a few exceptions like for example dracula um you know uh, maybe even frankenstein to a certain extent but also he's kind of a sympathetic hero um in this adaptation they do make quasimodo fairly sort of fairly sympathetic um, and sort of the hero um, within the story as well. Um, but he sort of has this kind of tragedy uh, surrounding him. And that's not just due to the fact that he's considered a monster by society, but uh, also because he um, is sort of isolated from the world as a result of it. So it, it, it ultimately works, I think, really well. And it's very fascinating to see these kinds of works because a lot of the times you'll see these actors and actresses and they must have been you know back then you, you you know when they look so young and you know how old this is and you're just seeing it through time you know you're you're actually seeing something that maybe I mean well this film was made in 1923 but it's still pretty old like over 90 years old 
um, when you're seeing that kind of amount of um, visual look into, you know, various people uh, that did actually exist and did actually put on a performance um, and are probably not alive today, it is rather fascinating to see. It's really a part of history. It really does, this, this film and a lot of films like it are really a, a testament to history and to the whole industry of filmmaking. So it's, it's really great to watch. And that's what I find to be the most entertaining a lot of the times by these very old timey films, in particular the silent era films, because they're just so, so, so old. Um, and they're getting so, so old. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, so it's definitely, I think, a worthy uh, adaptation and definitely worth recommendation. And it's probably one of the more well-known adaptations uh, of the story. And I think it ultimately works. Um, and uh, you do see similar scenarios that take place within the book, but then you also see a different spin that they put on certain uh, on certain parts. So it, it's kind of like the Disney version in that sense. You know, it, it, it took what it had and sort of made it its own, so to speak. Uh, so yeah, I think it's uh, definitely worthy of recommendation. Uh, all of this, cl uh, every single classic movie Monday of this particular month will revolve around a particular monster film and the minions are going to go in order. So um we start off with Hunchback, and we'll probably end with Frankenstein. Um, next one will be Phantom of the Opera, which will be next week. And I wish the minion whoever is doing that luck. Uh, but if there are any questions, comments, concerns, I'd be more than happy to answer them. But I think that's all I can really say about this particular adaptation. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you all have a pleasant day, week, month, and year. And I hope to see you all in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.